I have with me today a special guest, Colonel Douglas McGregor, to talk about all of the different fires going on around the globe, especially those that affect the United States. Colonel McGregor, thank you for joining me again today. Sure, happy to be here. So the, the biggest story in the news right now is the situation in the Red Sea does not seem to be cooling. Uh, now we've had an attack on a U.S. military base in the country of Jordan that resulted in three dead Americans and 34 injured. What is your assessment of this situation? And is the United States starting down a path towards war with the Middle East again? Well, it's, uh, it, it might as well say the Middle East, but primarily we're trying to forge a path to war with uh, Iran because that's what the Israeli state wants. And to be frank with you, we have no strategy towards the region. Uh, we have no policy. What we are essentially are instruments of Israeli national policy. And we take our instructions from them because there, we have no interest in supporting this campaign to effectively expel or kill all Palestinian Arabs in Gaza and ultimately also on the West Bank. And that's effectively what is now begun by the Israelis. We certainly don't have an interest in a war with Hezbollah or Iran, contrary to what many politicians are telling the American people. So I think the biggest problem right now is that the mainstream media the financial sector uh, and the government are all 100% behind this unconditional support for Israel. And they are proselytizing in favor of that. Most Americans really aren't paying attention, as we've discussed before. I think Americans are rightly focused on the border. Uh, they're, they're definitely seeing that. And that's why you're seeing the uh, left now under Biden and, and in general, the Washington swamp change its tune. Uh, they're they're starting to say, well, you know, we want to close the border, but you know, we just have to come to a compromise. Oh, that's a lot of nonsense. We all know that, and that should have happened years ago. Now people are openly discussing military power on the border. Well, that should have happened years ago as well. We did that for a hundred years, from 1840, 1846 to nineteen forty eight. There are reasons for all of that, but the bottom line is we're no better off. So in the meantime, uh, it's a case of. Watch what this hand does, but don't pay attention to the other hand. And uh, now that we've had this attack on, uh, it was actually, as I am told, designed to hit al Tamf, which is a large American base inside Syria. The watchtower that was struck and the Americans who were wounded or killed were just literally on the other side of the border in Jordan. But that was not originally the target. And remember, the Jordanian government has approved our presence in their country. The Syrian government has not. So we are illegally inside Syria. And those soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who are involved in Iraq and Syria, they have no mission uh, except to essentially improve security for Israel, which is kind of laughable because if anybody knows more about what's happening in Syria and Iraq than we do, it's the Israelis. Their intelligence is excellent. And then secondly, a little bit of oil that is squeaking through the system from Turkey into Israel is pretty much going to stop. Mr. Erdogan has dragged his feet on it, but very shortly the Israelis will be without any oil or natural gas anyway. And we are very, very vulnerable. And, and to be blunt, if, if the Iranians had done this, they would have hit us. Uh, this, this, is, this would not have been an accident. They have precise tactical and theater ballistic missiles. We're dealing with Arab militias. The Houthis are an Arab militia. The Shiite Arabs in, in Iraq are part of militias. That's what you've got in Hezbollah. All of these people are Arabs. And even though they may be Shiites, they are in solidarity with Arabs in Gaza. And as long as we do what we're doing in Gaza, which is to provide limitless qu quantities of supply for the Israelis in terms of ammunition, spare parts, aircraft, intelligence, even now we have lots of Americans in uniform on the ground in Israel, as long as we continue to underwrite this uh, terrible policy, well, we're going to be attacked by Arabs in the Middle East. It's very simple. Now, we made a terrible mistake with the Houthis because we beat our chests and said, we will punish the Houthis, we will defeat the Houthis. Well, the Houthis have turned out to be a lot tougher to take on than we imagined, which any of us who knew anything about the region knew to begin with. That is terrible terrain. It's very difficult to run around and identify the targets 
find the active missile systems and the fighters and do any damage. And these people have been through years of warfare with Saudi Arabia and us. Remember, we backed the Saudis. This produced a terrible famine in Yemen that killed hundreds of thousands and did enormous damage. These people are hardened to it. They're ready to fight and fight and fight. And they're going to do whatever they can to make us miserable until we change our policy. So if you want this to stop, Americans need to answer the question. Are we comfortable supporting Israel's policy in Gaza? If we're comfortable with what they're doing as a nation, then that's fine. The government should make it abundantly clear what we're doing. And that means we've got almost a half a million Arabs living inside uh, the Gaza Strip that have no homes, nothing over their heads, not enough to eat, suffering from all sorts of diseases as a result of bad water, have no power. And uh, everyone in Israel is celebrating because they want to eliminate these people. They see them, after all, as has been told repeatedly, as animals that deserve to be expelled, expunged, exterminated. Interesting. Uh, are we comfortable with that? I don't think most Americans are. But most Americans are not being told the truth. They don't really see what's happening. So we have no policy. We have no foreign policy. Our armed forces are now essentially the pawns of Israel and whatever Israel's lobby in the United States wants. And remember, the Israeli lobby has almost complete control of everyone on the Hill. And they also control the thinking and the policy making. But beyond that, you know, the, what happens in the media? And the media crushes anyone who speaks up and says, well, perhaps this is not a good idea. Then you are branded as an anti-Semite. The ad hominem attacks begin. If they can, they attack your sources of income. They try to disenfranchise you, destroy your bank accounts, and so forth. This, this is the way things are played right now in the United States. That's why I say this, this is not American foreign policy. Uh, this is Israeli foreign policy. And that's what's running the show. Yeah. Um, coming back to some American uh, foreign policy, yesterday, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham and John Cornyn of Texas called for President Biden to, direct, to, to directly attack Iran, bomb mm -hmm. them into the ground. Tucker Carlson called them effing lunatics that will get us into an out of control war. Tucker Carlson also warned the American people that the Biden administration wants a broader war with Iran. Uh, what are your thoughts on Tucker Carlson, co his comments? And then what are your thoughts on Lindsey Graham and John Cornyn calling for the, the destruction of Iran? Well, first of all, I and many others have been warning of the danger of a wider war with I Iran that could rapidly become regional and end up including the Russians and the Chinese and potentially others all aligned against us. This is not news. This is a very real danger. It's also not news, as I pointed out in an article that I published in the American Conservative a week ago. There was two parts, one Friday and then Saturday, on the perils of American foreign policy. And it goes into detail about why we militarily are not prepared for a major regional war, whether it's fought in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, or fought in the Middle East or anywhere else. Our stocks are way down. They're largely exhausted in many key categories, and we have no surge capacity. We can't turn to industry and say, turn out thousands of missiles and millions of munitions overnight. We don't have that capacity. So if we're drawn into this thing, we will rapidly exhaust our stocks. Those things are just completely ignored because the individuals you mentioned who are obviously benefiting enormously from money that comes out of the defense industry, as well as other foreign lobbies like the Israeli lobby, they have no interest in uh, what happens to us, what happens to the American people, or what happens to our soldiers. If they had any interest in the welfare of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, they would have demanded the withdrawal of these soldiers from Iraq and Syria and uh, everywhere else in the region a long time ago, because there are so few of them, they're in isolated bases, they're easy targets. Now, what's changed recently, and this is the most, most, dangerous aspect of the whole thing. Up until now, certainly since 1991, on the ground, we have never faced <clears throat> formidable opponents, opponents that were organized into armies, into air forces, into air defenses. Most have had no naval power at all. What we faced are loosely organized irregulars, militias, 
we call them terrorists because they support causes we don't. So you always brand you're an opponent to terrorists. You know, your friends are superheroes, men in white hats. The people you hate are terrorists. These are not uh, third-rate opponents anymore. I Iran is a very powerful state. There are 90 million people living in that country. You're talking about a very high level of technical expertise. <clears throat> they have built tens of thousands of rockets and missiles. The Israelis will give you the briefings if you ask for it and tell you what very fine quality work they do, the high quality of their engineers and their capabilities. The Iranians can launch enough conventional warheads on missiles to flatten most of Israel. That's what people don't seem to understand. And they can target us with great precision. Just a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> we watched as they killed a Mossad agent in his house, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> with his family. And he was in close proximity to the U.S. Embassy. U.S. Embassy sustained no damage. They also went after others, ISIS targets. And these ISIS targets were also affiliated with Kurdish interests because they were united by hatred of Hezbollah and Iran. So they targeted these pla these places and people with enormous effect and accuracy. That can be applied against us. They can hit us in Qatar. They can hit us in Kuwait. They can hit our forces at sea. They can hit us all over the place. We haven't even begun to discuss <clears throat> the substantial Hezbollah presence that is in Mexico. And for that matter, there are also Islamist elements from the Sunni side operating in Mexico. Large numbers of people driven out of Syria and other Arab countries have found a place to settle in Mexico. Some of those came as a result of being refugees, but large numbers also came there deliberately. This is, this is a war that will have more than one front against us. We have no idea how many of these people have been introduced into the United States through our borders. We're, we think we have recently 9 million illegals, but we may have as many as 22 to 30 million in the country. So you, you look at the equation and what you have staring you in the face is, is the very high probability that if we turn this into a regional war by ultimately attacking Iran or looking for some excuse that we can you know, present to the American people as justifying the use of force, we're not only unprepared for it, we're going to have to fight on all sorts of levels against all sorts of people. And we're talking now about kinetic matters, but there's also the cyberspace and the uh, vulnerability of our power grids. I mean, we could go on and on. What about our nuclear power stations? All of these things fall into that category. And I think Americans are being lulled into a false sense of confidence. Americans have believed for too long that war is something that only happens on someone else's soil. Oh, we, we bombed country X last week. Well, you know, they probably deserved it. Nobody knows. Nobody cares. You always have a third of the electorate that cheers whenever somebody is bombed. That's dangerous. That's the sort of insanity that got Britain into World War I, that dragged them into World War I, where they killed almost 800 million people in, from Great Britain. That doesn't even include the imperial forces from overseas. The, the point I'm trying to make is, if we go forward as people like Lindsey Graham and Senator Cornyn want... We risk war on a scale that we have not seen in this country since the Civil War, here and abroad. I don't think anybody wants that, and I don't think we need it. But then again, you know, I hold the minority position in Washington because right now everybody says, absolutely, kill and drive those Arabs out. And by the way, I don't support Arab Islamist organizations that advocate the destruction of Israel either. You know, that, that's dead wrong. I wouldn't support Hamas under any circumstances, and simply because I don't think millions of Palestinians should be further removed from their homes and driven into exile or killed makes me an agent of Hamas. I'm not. I want Israel to survive, and I'm afraid, and I've said this from the very beginning, as soon as the 7 October event occurred, and it became clear that the Israelis were only moderately interested in the hostages. This was a trigger that they longed for, so that they could begin this process of driving all the people that are Arabs in Gaza, in the West Bank, whether they're Muslims or Christians is irrelevant, out of the country. Now, I understand that. 
But when I discussed this on previous occasions with him, I said, be very, very careful. I don't think you can do this as long as the world is watching and the world is watching. It's not going to accept this. Well, that's where we are. And right now, Israel and we and the United Kingdom are alone. Yeah. We're isolated. Gee, what a surprise. Yeah. Wow. I, I feel like, you know, Tucker was heavily engaged in supporting Bush and the war in Iraq. And then his eyes were open and he realized, oh, wait a minute. We've made a huge mistake. I think this is why he is saying, America, be careful. You've got, you know, these effing lunatics at, at the at, at the Capitol Hill pushing us into a war that none of us really want. He, I, I think he's warning, let's not go down that path again. Well, we're dealing with the same people that Bill Clinton uh, personally did not want to listen to, but was trapped into listening to. That's how we were dragged into Bosnia and then ultimately in the Kosovo air campaign. We move, And we can even go all the way back to the Somali disaster. And remember, Somalia was a place where initially we just went in to feed people. Ultimately, we end up at war with a substantial portion of the population. It's insane. We went in ostensibly for the purpose of removing Saddam Hussein from power. We did not announce our intention to try and forcibly democratize millions of Arabs, turn them into Anglo-Saxons uh, at our, at our uh, pleasure. That was not originally stated. On the contrary, people were told, be prepared to leave Iraq as, as fast as you got in there. Now, one of the failures that we encountered early on, both in Afghanistan and in Iraq, was the failure to identify, find, and remove Saddam Hussein, and, his, and the other was Osama bin Laden. Those were egregious military intelligence failures. And then we had to, quote unquote, stay. Well, that was wonderful for the people that dragged us in there to begin with under Bush and then subsequently kept us there. For how long? For years, for more than a decade. We eventually left. We left in the middle of the night from Iraq because had we left during the day, we'd have been shot to pieces. So we left at night without telling anybody. But then we went back in using the excuse of fighting ISIS. But most of the fighting against ISIS was done by Iranians and the Shiite militias that the Iranians trained and armed and the Russians. They did most of the damage. The Turks and many of the other Arabs in the region were privately sympathetic to ISIS. They still are, but they keep their mouths shut. They, they backed off. But you're never going to completely eliminate these Islamists on the Sunni side. It's, it's an impossibility you're always going to have some residual presence from those people or of those people. And the point is, that's not why we're in Iraq or Syria right now. We're in there, as I said before, ostensibly for the purpose of adding to Israel's security. I don't think we have. I think that we're simply out there as targets. What we can do and should do, do for Israel, if we're friends, and I think we are, is tell them that this has to stop. Because the greatest danger right now is that this proceeds, becomes a full-fledged war, and the missile arsenals that the Iranians have will be launched against Israel and ultimately flatten the place. Remember, Israel's relatively small. There isn't much strategic depth. We all understand that, and we can't stop those missiles. Now, the Israelis respond, well, we'll use a nuclear weapon. I think if the Israelis were to use a nuclear weapon, they would have the entire world breathing down their necks. And I think it would be catastrophic for Israel. So the easy solution, which is the last one that we will adopt, is to tell Mr. Netanyahu, we will not support you until you halt completely, 100% your operations in Gaza. Now, if that makes me an anti-Semite, God preserve us from the people who claim they are Israeli champions, because they are taking Israel down the path into hell, from which Israel may not ever come back. Yeah, wow. Um. Golly. Okay. Speaking of the Turks and the Russians, um, I read today that the Kremlin announced President Vladimir Putin will travel to Turkey next month to meet with President uh, Erdogan. Um, do you think the main purpose of this is to have a, a, a NATO nation that's typically sympathetic towards Russia um, host uh, talks on how to end the Russia-Ukraine war? Uh, is Turkey being seen as a Switzerland, or what do you think is going on there? No, I don't think anybody views Turkey as a as Switzerland. Nobody sees Switzerland, for, unfortunately, as they once did. I think 
Switzerland surrendered its neutrality when it cast its lot with the EU and NATO. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Erdogan, who is nothing if not extraordinarily smart, is simply taking advantage of, of an obvious opportunity. The Turks are effectively a paper ally when it comes to NATO. They stay in because that gives them some degree of influence over NATO, and it gives them a channel of communications with us. Again, no one in the region, including Iran, wants to go to war with us. They would all prefer to avoid that. But the Turks <clears throat> have also been bribed recently. Uh, remember, the Turks invested in Russian air defense systems instead of Raytheon's Patriot system. When they did that, we sanctioned them and said they could not participate in the F-35 program. And then we said we would not honor any further uh, deals, including a high-tech aircraft like the F-16. We've suddenly lifted sanctions, and we're now sending F-16s to Turkey. Well, we're bribing the Turks to stay out of the Israeli-Muslim war that's spreading across the region. I think it may help for a short time, but it's not going to change things in the long run. And secondly, you now have the Turks within the framework of this new NATO exercise that's underway at sea, cooperating with the French Navy. And of course, everyone is laughing uproariously in Turkey because the Turks and the French hate each other passionately. So whatever cooperation is, it's grudging. I guess if the Turks were given the option, they'd rather sink the French fleet. So the, the bottom line is all of this is flimsy, facade-like nonsense. NATO is comatose. Putin didn't kill it. We killed it when we dragged it into this proxy war that made no sense and, and then gave Russia the opportunity to demonstrate that it has the capacity to act like a great power. We never had a chance against a, na a nation that was effectively self-sufficient. Russia is now more cohesive, stronger as a nation state than perhaps it's been in decades, certainly not since Tsarist times. We, we've blown it. We, we made mistake after mistake after mistake. And that's why the next mistake is let's escalate. Just as I fear in Israel, the Israeli government is going to say, well, we'll take a breather right now on uh, Gaza, take a temporary breather. We'll turn on Hezbollah and we'll keep working hard to make life miserable for the Palestinians on the West Bank. Well, the war with Hezbollah, if Israel launches it, is not going to go well. Hezbollah is infinitely more sophisticated and capable than Hamas, and most of us are still in a state of shock that Hamas performs so brilliantly against the Israeli Defense Force. That's going to make things worse, and from there, it's a short step to war with Iran. And as much as the Iranians and the Turks dislike each other, they share the same broader interest in the Muslim world, which is to deal decisively with this dangerous state called Israel, which from their vantage point is disruptive destabilizing, and frankly, very, very dangerous. We don't see it that way because we don't see ourselves logically or objectively either. If we go somewhere and bomb, we're righteous. And whomever we bombed is the enemy. It's the same mentality. you know. But that's not the way the, the Muslims uh, in, in the Middle East see it. And remember, and this is something else that is never mentioned, uh, the provocation, the Israeli provocation that went on in the Al-Aqsa Mosque shortly before the Al-Aqsa flood, and Al-Aqsa Mosque is the third holiest place in Islam. Whether or not you like Islam, whether or not you approve of it, doesn't matter. Those are facts. So now we're dealing with more than a billion is Muslims who are enraged at Israel, enraged at the United States, and increasingly enraged at the United Kingdom. Where is this going to take us, Steve? Where are we headed? We're steering ourselves up to the edge of an abyss. We're going to go over the waterfall and into disaster. Yeah. No, that, that, so, yeah, we have this hotbed going on leading towards war. We also, I wanted to get your thoughts on this because um, I, I have um, people like Gerald Salente from the Trends Journal on and and he says things like, you know, we're already in World War. You think that they just start overnight. No, they slowly build. Um, just this morning, I was reading that Ukraine is telling their citizens, Belarus is about to attack us. Be ready to be attacked by Belarus. They're also saying Hungary and Romania are about to come take back Western Ukraine. 
And then Finland is telling their people, Russia's about to attack us. And if they do, Belarus will jump in. And so like, there's all these rumors of wars going on. And it, like, doesn't that just put everyone on pins and needles? And, and that's can, what can really light the fire of a, a, a third world war? Well, first, that's the playbook. If you're a neoconservative and the neocons are driving the train, they're part of the larger globalist elite that wants to transform us into sedated sheep. You know, they, they want to degrade the concept of a human being with a, with a living soul and adopt the atheistic uh, sort of materialistic approach to dealing with people as fung fungible products or commodities things that are meaningless in and of themselves that can be employed as they see fit. This kind of Trotskyite logic and thinking was the origin behind the common turn. And we've become a kind of 21st century version of the same thing. No, you're absolutely right. We, we, are, we are sowing the, the seeds of discord everywhere we possibly can. Now, can all of these come together and result in a global catastrophe? I suppose it's possible. It's never impossible. But there are a few differences that need to be noted. In 1914, when you went, when we saw the First World War break out, all of the major participants were already primed for some sort of conflict. They all underestimated its dangers and its destructiveness, but they were all ready to pounce. They were all ready in the launch mode. It didn't take much to cause it. In fact, uh, Gavrilo Princip, the man that killed the Archduke, said after he was captured, even if I had never been there and never shot the Archduke, eventually this war was going to happen. Well, there's some truth to that. But what you have is the slow burn today that takes months and years versus the month or so that elapsed between 28 June and the end of July, one, two, three, four, August. In other words, everyone did not instantly pull the trigger. It took a succession of events. Well, take that same sort of choreography and apply it to the world today. We're not going to see World War III break out this week or next week. It's going to take a few months. I think by April, May timeframe, all the pieces will be in place. And whoever is not involved in the region or externally will become involved. Remember, Russia is closely aligned with Iran. The Russians are not going to allow Iran to be destroyed. By the way, if Turkey entered this uh, fight, the Russians would not allow Turkey to be destroyed. The, the interesting thing is that Russia and China seem to be very concerned about preserving the international system. We seem hell-bent to destroy it. And yet we're the people that talk about, you know, the rule-based order. What rules? Whatever we say is the rule. Whatever we say, you do. That's all. It's all hypocritical nonsense. It's meaningless nonsense. It's a facade. We're not even enforcing our own laws inside the United States. We're rewarding criminals for their criminal behavior. We're putting policemen in jail. Policemen are afraid to enforce the law. We won't defend our borders. We now have a president who wants to commit federal forces against Texas and anyone else that challenges the right of his party, his administration, the swamp, just put it all together, to open our borders and flood us with millions of people that we did not invite, we can't use, we can't assimilate, we can't put to work. And everybody talks about, well, our economy is growing. It's government spending. We are not growing. Our economy is weak. That's the point. And our financial position has never been more fragile. And it's only a matter of time until the world holds a fire sale on our treasuries. Look, we are going to take $300 billion in assets that are Russian <clears throat> and illegally seize those and turn those monies or assets over to Ukraine this criminal regime in Kiev that's our puppet led by Zelensky. Now, let's stop and think about that. If you watch this, if you're India, if you're China, if you're Saudi Arabia, pick your, pick your country, Brazil, uh, Argentina, anywhere, why would you want to hold U.S. treasuries? 
How do you know the rug's not going to be pulled out from under you the way we are pulling it out from under Russia? They're going to start offloading our treasuries. And remember, most of these were purchased when they were at 0% interest. So these things are of very little value to them anymore. It's a losing proposition. But that cascading effect overseas is also going to be felt here because our banks own the same toxic treasuries that are now have no real value. They are a burden, not an asset, but they can't sell them. What happens to us? We're, we're just walking into a giant bear trap. That's the point. Yeah. Oh, gosh. No, you make a great point. You made, you made me think of something that uh, Stephen R. Covey once said, you know, he he said, oh, you know, G Jesus has this example of you leave the 99 to go after the one. But he said, you can also flip that around. If the 99 see you mistreating the one, they lose trust in the shepherd, right? And so what you're saying is, you know, if, if they see America, United States, steal this money from Russia and then give it away to a corrupt nation, then these other nations go, wait a minute, what if they did this to us? Uh, let, let's get out of their paper. Let's get out of their assets. Um, like you say, that that could create a huge firestorm, uh, you know, financially for us here in here in the United States. Um, final question. I, I appreciate you coming on. Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts on this situation at the border? We have Governor Abbott who's saying, I have the right to defend my state. I have the right to keep my people safe. We are, you know, the, the biggest loading zone for illegal immigrants coming into the country. I'm, I want these other National Guards coming in. Let's protect this. And now you have the federal government saying, no, absolutely not. Tear down the barbed wire. Let them in. Process them faster. Uh, and, and But then at the same time, giving lip service saying, we, we might need to close the border. Immigration's out of control. Does the, does all of the the positive talking points out of the Biden administration, is that all just to get reelected? Like, what are your thoughts on this situation? Yes. <clears throat> it's meaningless. Okay. Just, just ignore it. Uh, you know, if it were flatulence, it wouldn't stink up a broom closet. Just ignore it. What are we seeing happen? Well, we're seeing something very tragic. National Guardsmen, just like soldiers in the regular army, are all sworn to uphold the Constitution and to protect the American people. And we're actually talking about a situation where conceivably this president could order federal forces to intervene against Guardsmen on the border with Texas in order to open the border to millions more people about whom we know nothing, and many of whom probably present a clear and present danger to our country and to our society. What is wrong? This is, this is not something that the U.S. Army and the National Guard should have to confront. The, these people serve the same flag. You know, it's no surprise that soldiers being interviewed, these are regular Army soldiers at various Army posts, including Fort Hood, which is now Fort Cavazos, are saying, I'm not going to do it. You know, I agree with the National Guard. We should protect the country. Some of them have said, well, I'll, I'll go over to the Guard. Well, that's punishable under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It would be very sad if something like that happened and we were prosecuting soldiers who have sworn to protect the country for, for not committing treason. Because arguably, when you look at what this administration is being done, it looks increasingly a lot like treason. Why would you subject your, your country to this? It doesn't make any sense. Why would you subject your people to this? I was talking to some, some people recently that had lost their jobs. You know, it's a bad economy, but in some cases, these people had lost their jobs because their jobs were then had gone to illegals. Well, gee, what a surprise. The illegal will work for less. And then we have to listen to people working for the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal pour buckets of filth and abuse all over American citizens to say, well, gee, we should be grateful for all these illegals. They're better people. They'll work. Americans won't. Well, Americans want a living wage. Don't they deserve it? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Lots of, uh, lots of problems, you know. I, uh, I, I hope they all work out. The the one that has me nervous, you know, is uh, 
I can't imagine being in the military where I go, okay, wait a minute. I've, I've sworn an oath to the constitution. I love my country. I will give blood for this flag. And then the, the, you know, the, the chief commander is saying to go is giving an order that feels like it's against the constitution, that it feels like it's against protecting the United States. I mean, I can't imagine the mental, the mental game that is going on in people's minds right now as they are potentially sent against their own brothers and sisters in Texas. Well, no, I mean, that no responsible commander in chief would do that to soldiers and guardsmen. It's out of the question. That's why I'm saying no soldier or guardsman should ever have to confront this issue. Now, this is something that should have been sorted out a long time ago in Washington, D.C. But unfortunately, the American people are an afterthought. And oh, by the way, we need to bomb Iran. Insane. Makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, people like you and others, uh, you're coming together under our country, our choice to help educate people on values, the Constitution, uh, love for the country, love for family and freedom. Uh, is our country, ourchoice.com the best place for me to, to push some traffic so they can learn Absolutely. about the organization? Well, we're not so much about educating, although hopefully we, we will do some of that. We think large numbers of Americans understand what you and I have been discussing. We want them to join us. We want other like-minded organizations to join us. We will give them room on our platform. We're building a media platform, as well as building the membership in our organization, which we regard as a movement, which we think can become the third way in American politics. In other words, conceivably, over the long term, it can become the foundation for a third party. We badly need an American national party. The Democrats and Republicans don't qualify in that category that's the problem yeah okay well i'll push i'll push uh, people down uh through that link um i appreciate you coming on i know your time is valuable thank you for all of your uh insight all the research you do to keep us up to date on so many different uh, <laughs> so many different battles i mean it, it, it's it's insane the amount of information uh that they're putting out there but thank you and i, I hope you have a great rest of your day hey thank you too steve appreciate it bye-bye